Hi everyone, welcome. Good evening to all of you. I am Dr. Crystal Shannon. I'm an associate professor and associate director in the School of Nursing. I'm also one of the founding members of tonight's sponsor organization, the IUN School of Business African American Community Advancement Program. Long title, but we've shortened it a little bit. It's otherwise known as AACAP. I'm here to welcome each and every one of you to what we believe will be an invigorating discussion on African Americans in healthcare, the contributions, the Did anyone else lose audio? I just signed back I in. Did. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, mm -hmm. so again, I'm just welcoming all of you to our session tonight. Um, we're going to have a really good discussion. We're really excited about what the discussion can hold. And as we get started, I just wanted to give everyone just a couple of house housekeeping items. Um, please remain on mute for the duration of the hour long session. And you are also very welcome to post your questions for the moderator as well as the panelists to the chat window throughout the entire session. Someone will be moderating the chat window and a copy of all the posted questions will be shared with the moderator for group discussion when it opens up for audience discussion. So now let me go ahead and introduce our moderator for tonight's event. And we're really excited because we have with us tonight Dr. Monica Salinas Saunders. Monica joined the School of Public and Environmental Affairs, otherwise known as SPIA. Um, she joined us back in fall of 2011. Prior to her employment at IUN, Monica was an assistant professor of sociology and criminal justice at the University of North Carolina in Pembroke, North Carolina. She holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Pittsburgh, and she's also completed a two-year postdoc at Purdue University, West Lafayette, with the Military Family Research Institute. Her research interests lie in social institutions, such as prisons, the military, and the family, and she's developed research studies on incarceration, offender rehabilitation, and interpersonal violence and victimization. Her recent work was published in the Journal of Interpersonal Violence, the Prison Journal, Victims and Offenders, and the Journal of Criminal Justice Education. Monica, welcome to our session, and we're really excited. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, Crystal, for the very warm introduction and for inviting me today. Um, this is a, a very interesting program, especially because uh, as a sociologist and a social justice advocate, I have an interest in diversity. So I, uh, even though I'm not an expert in health sciences, I find myself at home in sharing this interest with all of you. Thank you so much. So uh, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, and I would like to start with our very own uh, Dr. Carol Rosell. Um, she's an assistant clinical professor at Indiana University Northwest. She teaches undergraduate and graduate nursing courses in management, leadership, community health, and legal issues for healthcare. She's also part of the Indiana University Interprofessional Practice Education Team. Dr. Rosell specializes in uh, um, nursing problem-based learning for effective course delivery and student engagement. She has published articles and presented multiple presentations on mitigation of stress in nursing students and diversity of the healthcare team. Dr. Rosell has spent 22 years in various leadership positions from manager to chief nurse executive. It was instrumental in improving patient satisfaction scores, promotion of evidence-based practice in care delivery, and the establishment of a satisfac uh, I'm sorry, an establishment of a nursing council leadership model um, before shared governance was popular. Welcome, Dr. Rosell. The next uh, panelist I'm going to introduce is Dr. Kerry Ranson. Um, Dr. Ranson earned a bachelor in chemistry from Wayne University in 1985 and continued his studies at Wayne to complete a doctorate in medicine in 1990. Dr. Ransom specialized in urology with a residency program at the University of Illinois at Chicago in 1996. Since then, has worked at both Lapore Hospital in Lapore, Indiana, and at Franciscan Alliance in Michigan City, Indiana. Since 2008, Dr. Ransom is the president of Progressive Urology. 
Dr. Ranson is certified by the American Board of Urology. Welcome, Dr. Ranson. I'm going to introduce next uh, Dr. Janice Smith-Hill. Dr. Smith-Hill um, earned a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and a Master's of Science in Nursing Administration from the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. In 2020, Jenny became a certified professional coach through the Academy for Creative Coaching, which is an accredited organization. Also in 2020, Dr. Smith Hill joined SSM Health, and maybe you can tell us more about this later, um, a Catholic-based not-for-profit integrated delivery network located in the Midwest with a team of more than 40,000 members, which is astonishing. She's the Chief Human Resources Officer for the organization. Welcome, Dr. Janet Smith Hill. Dr. Monica, you're giving me too much credit, so I'm not a physician or a PhD, so it's just Janet. Oh, it doesn't matter. Everybody okay, is a, okay. It's a doctor <laughs> in their own specialty. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Janet. You bet. Um, And then I'm going to move forward to introduce uh, Dr. Janice Seabrook. Um, she's a, a graduate of Gary Roosevelt High School. Uh, yeah, uh, we like the high school. Uh, she earned a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Tuskegee University in 1987 and a degree in medicine from um, Meharry Medical College in 1994. She completed a residency at Methodist Hospital in Gary to become a family medicine physician. Because of her commitment to medical administration, she also completed an MBA from Purdue University in 2005. In 1996, she served on the mayor of Gary's task force and the Indiana State Department of Health um, to obtain funding for start, uh, to start a health center in Gary. Um, and this is very important because it started uh, um, opening new opportunity. And since that time, Dr. Seabrook has led Community Health Net in opening six locations throughout Northwest Indiana and oversaw the purchase of a mobile medical unit and a bus to transport patients uh, to and from the appointments. Welcome, Dr. Seabrook. So this is our panel. So I believe we're gonna continue now with our panelists making their own initial remarks. And I'm gonna start with the questions. Um, the, the very first question is uh, um, a sort of icebreaker uh, for everybody. And um, I'm gonna ask you, in your opinion, why do health inequities exist? And why have they continued in our society? Anyone among the panelists who wants to um, start? Um, I think I'll, I can break the ice. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Seabrook. Go ahead. I help get the conversation rolling. I do believe that health inequities exist, and I also believe that they persist and are continuing to persist. And the reason why I believe this is that it's really um, embedded in the structural way that healthcare um, has been provided um, throughout the years. And if we really think about healthcare being tied to employment in most places for people to have quality health insurance and to have quality health care, we've tied it to one of, to employment. And when that employment no longer exists, then we have people who are unable to not only take care of themselves, but their family, because we have such an attachment to having a job equals having health insurance. And uh, as, as long as that equation exists, we're going to continue to have people who are unemployed, or on the lower income uh, spectrum who, uh, whose jobs, uh, the premiums may be too high for them to afford. So they will continue to be uh, people who are employed but without health insurance. It sounds simple, but it's not because we tie everything to 
employment. And when you're not employed or you're employed part-time, then you're, you're not going to be able to get the quality of care or services uh, equitably as uh, someone who is uh, fully insured. Absolutely. Anyone else who wants to jump in from the panelists? I'll just add to that, that mm -hmm. um, I believe that the inequalities exist because they're allowed to exist, because there have not been any real concrete um, efforts made to bridge the gap between the um, level and the um, quality of health care that is dispersed across ethnicities and, um, and geographically. Very good point. Anyone else? I, I agree. I can. Yes. Um, when I see patients and they don't have insurance, they're, they feel inferior. And when you say you need a procedure, the first thing they think about is how is this going to affect me economically? Mm -hmm. Am I going to get a bill for this service? And this is someone who cares about paying bills, but unfortunately, they've been disenfranchised and don't have job opportunities or they just lost a job. So healthcare is one of those entities when you can't afford it, it can put you further down the economic ladder. So it's really difficult for people to, to feel good about participating in healthcare when they have already so many things stacked against them. Mm -hmm. I agree with that, everything that's been said. And uh, I would add that I believe that health inequalities or disparities exist as well because of implicit bias uh, of the providers. So, I mean, there are studies that have been done that have demonstrated that if people have insurance, uh, they've got good jobs, et cetera, their outcomes, if they're people of color, especially African-American may be worse than you know, their white counterparts, everything else is equal. So it really does point to the interaction and the implicit bias that providers are bringing to the care setting. Agree. Very good. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna continue the conversation uh, with another question. Um, we often hear the African-Americans do not trust the healthcare field. We hear this all the time, right? Um, and might not be for every African-American, but it seems to be known then within the African-American communities, there is distrust. Why do you think that this is so? And what are the issues behind this reality? I can start on this question. Mm -hmm. And historically, I think when you talk to African-Americans, Tuskegee experiment comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And that was certainly a paramount uh, study that just kind of brought us back uh, in our thinking. And what basically happened, there were about 400 patients enrolled in this study who had syphilis, who had a diagnosis. They weren't injected with syphilis, but they basically had syphilis and the healthcare individuals who were seeing after those individuals chose not to offer them any treatment. They wanted to see what happened to this mm -hmm. disease as it got further along, the neurologic effects. So ultimately when this experiment was exposed, it was, uh, it was an absolute disaster mm -hmm. and it created this problem that we're dealing with even today because it set forth the groundwork for African Americans and the like not to be trustworthy of healthcare professionals. So no matter what you say, this is entrenched in the back of most of our African American brothers and sisters. So this is where we're starting with today, even with this COVID problem that we're having. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I agree with you. And we can take it back uh, even further to where mm -hmm. Uh, African-American women were subjected to medical procedures without mm -hmm. consent um, mm -hmm. during uh, slavery times uh, for those procedures were done without any anesthesia, without any pain measures or anything like that. So this is, you know, this, um, this, this has, like I said before, it's really been ingrained 
into the system. So it's, it's the system of it, mistrust is built into the system. And it's, and it's been since the inception of people who look like me who were brought to this country uh, without their permission. Right. And I think emotionally, you know, if you're trying to struggle to see if you can trust the person that you are um, indicting yourself to, whereas someone who's not African-American, a white person, may have implicit trust. I mean, they may, they come to the table, they have nothing standing in their way that would interfere with the treatment plan, understanding what's happening. But someone that looks like me may be thinking, are you trying to hurt me? Are you genuine in your intent? You know, except you got to fight through all that to even understand what people are, you know, trying to tell you. So I do think that it is um, an emotional burden um, that, that people of color experience and it's, it's real. Uh, and I think you have to work through that, that labor to even be clear about what treatment you're being offered or what your condition is, so. I can remember, um, I, I was just gonna say, I can remember as a uh, young person uh, talking to, I'm from the deep South, I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. So going back in the summers to visit family members talking about wanting to be a doctor and going to medical school and things like that. And just hearing things from my grandparents, friends, and, 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 and the way they felt about the medical system in general. Mm -hmm. Because typically when they were growing up, you would hear that someone had cancer and a few weeks later you were going to their funeral. And, mm -hmm. and back then funerals were held in the house. The wakes mm -hmm. were held in the house. So there was an equation of if you finally do get a chance to see the doctor, you the doctor here. finds something bad, mm -hmm. and yes. a few weeks later, you're no longer here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So if I don't go, I won't mm -hmm. hear bad news. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. well, Dr. Seabrook kind of touched on what I was going to say. A lot of it is from personal experience, mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, needless to say, all this reported now in mainstream um, media, social media, and even things that are acted out on television shows now. So it just adds to what has traditionally been placed upon African Americans in healthcare. So now it just makes it that much harder to, to trust. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And it is also important to share this information we um, people were not African Americans because not everybody actually is aware of these issues. Is not aware of the history uh, of this uh, uh, mistrust of the healthcare profession within African American communities. So it is important to share this and discuss with other individuals in society. So as a follow up from this, I thank you so much because this is, I'm learning so much as I hear um, uh, you talking and I wish all our students were attending these events uh, because uh, they are the main ones who need to learn, uh, the new generations need to learn this so, so that we can change the system. Does medicine Oh, the black and brown community reparations for past abuses. What do you think? This is kind of one of those uh, big questions, right? Why or why not? Uh, how do you feel about reparation? And if yes, what kind of reparations do you think it would be most appropriate? So for me, I think it would be uh, multifactorial. Um, I see uh, reparations in the form of healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and at times people will say, I, I run a f fairly qualified health center. And so it's like, well, why would you say something like that? There are fairly qualified health centers across the United States and its territories for people to go who don't have health insurance. Well, that's the obvious answer. And our fees are, uh, we have sliding fee scale. We make it very affordable, but that's primary uh, services. That's family medicine, that's pediatrics, that's OB. We're doing psychiatry now, uh, dental and vision. But then when it gets to the urologist, mm -hmm. the general surgeons, the endocrinologist, mm -hmm. when my diabetic needs cataract surgery, mm -hmm. I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. I have to go on the goodwill of a surgeon who I know who will try to work and do a discount with me to get mm -hmm. this person cataract surgery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or I have to try and write a grant, which we did several years ago uh, to get colonoscopies paid for, for people who had not had a colonoscopy 
at age 50 or 55 uh, to increase the number of African-American men and women who were over 50 who were not receiving colon cancer screenings. So, I mean, there are so many hoops that have to be jumped through to get specialty services. I think that as we expand community health centers across the United States, we have the primary care covered, but the problem and the issue is when we start to get into the cardiology and those type of services, mm -hmm. there is very problematic. If I so, could just go in the same direction, but in, in just a little offshoot from there, I think we need to improve the barriers to education. I think mm -hmm. that growing up in the inner city, which I was one of those individuals, at that time, you still could do pretty well, but when you got to college, it was like dropping off a cliff. I mean, I could not compete with the students who were exposed from the suburbs, and it it bamboozled me to the point where my confidence was lost when I first got to undergrad because mm -hmm. I felt that these students were smarter than me, that there was just something I missed during my entire education process. So I think that right now in particular, there's probably a continental divide between the haves and the haves not, particularly mm -hmm. with what we're dealing with from a health standpoint across this country. Uh, doing the Zoom uh, learning and, and all of these things, it's always gonna be those who have will, will certainly get it and those who don't have will ultimately be further behind. So unless we bridge the gap educationally, this thing is gonna be an issue. So to me, that's paramount importance. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree with that. I think it comes along with the, sort of the sequela that Dr. Seabrook started with was employment. So the education and how well you're educated, you know, typically will help you get a job relative to it's good job or not such a good job. And there you got healthcare again. So it is a vicious cycle, um, but I do think it is all of that. Um, I think, mm -hmm. I don't know how popular this will be, but I think Medicaid needs to be expanded in every state. Mm -hmm. um, you know, o Obamacare, for what it did right, I think we need to reserve that. And if it wasn't working in other areas, don't toss the whole thing out. Just fix, you know, what needs to be refined. Because none of us, we're all in the same boat. We're having different experiences, but none of us are really going to succeed and hit our very um, top, you know, levels of potential if others of us are struggling. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we, you know, we, we experience that, we see that. So um, reparations or not, I don't, that's a huge question. I kind of grappled with what I would say, but definitely solving some of these systemic issues would be a step well on the way. This is very important because you're offering different definitions of reparation and different solutions as part of reparation, which could be really a comprehensive uh, program. And I'm particularly interested in the idea of education. So um, what does uh, Dr. Rosell think about uh, this uh, idea of reparation in the education field? I think that that's very important. And I have to agree with um, Dr. Ranson that that's a good start. Um, I personally didn't necessarily have that challenge of keeping up, but my children experienced that. Um, and they're like in their 30s now, but going away to college, it was like they came up in Chicago public schools. And so initially it was the difference between night and day and trying to compete and keep up with, with students from all over everywhere at the schools that they were at. Yeah. So it was very difficult. So starting at that point, I mean, even some of the things that I learned in the last couple of weeks with just some books that I'm reading and some things it's like there's so much out there about how African Americans and people of color were were treated that I, mm -hmm. I thought I knew something. Mm -hmm. But listen, when I started reading these books or whatever, I'm like, I didn't know anything. I, I, I just knew the tip of the iceberg. But the rest of those things that were going on, I had no clue about how much of that was kept from us. And I think that knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. And the better we equipped people to know even just what a disease is, 
what people went through to get us to this point where we should be able to sit at the table and help make those decisions is, is really important. So starting off with education, I, I think is a good point. I also made a point about, I was on the same page with Dr. Seabrook when it came to um, the um, providing medical care, because I think that's essential as well. But again, you can get all the best medical care in the world, but if you don't understand who, what, and why they're doing to you what they're doing, it still doesn't make a difference. So we got to get that education in and medical care together, I think would be the reparation that's needed. And, and you, you, Dr. Ranson uh, went in the direction I was going when I said it's multifactorial. Those reparations should be in the form of uh, things across uh, generations, but then also you know, so for someone in their uh, elementary to high school years and, and going into college or trade or whatever that is, that would look like education. But someone as an adult that's fresh out of college, hasn't started that job yet, has no coverage, has no insurance. So what do reparations look like? And I think that it has many tentacles uh, across the board and across generations uh, for uh, people of African American. And descent. Mm -hmm. I saw something in the chat mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if uh, many people have uh, heard about uh, Henrietta Lack. I'm sure yeah. Dr. Ramson has. I'm sure Dr. Ramson saw Gila slides when he was in medical <laughs> school because I know I did and you know to that so someone asked in the chat about where could they go mm -hmm. and about uh, the history of some of the things that have have happened. So I think that that's a good place to start. The story of Henrietta Lacks is a good place to start. Absolutely. See, I, I'm glad you're doing this, uh, Dr. Seabrook, because I think it's nice to keep the conversation going fluidly. So Mike, would you like to read a couple of those questions that are in the chat? And then maybe we can go back to the questions that we had prepared. But I think it, it, it kind of, uh, since the audience are interested in this, that we can uh, make the conversation more fluid. Sure, there's a question in the chat regarding biases that exist in the mental health in particular. Would mental health care be considered as an extension of physical health care or are these special issues to be considered? So in the area of mental health where there's a stigma uh, sometimes and people are afraid to perhaps admit uh, they, they need help coping with things from a middle standpoint. How would you assess, uh, how would you suggest we, we address the mental health aspect? So at our health center and many health centers across the United States, back in 2015, we were provided funding by the federal government to integrate behavioral health or mental health services as, as it's known with some, in some groups, but we call it behavioral health services, mm -hmm. um, integrate those services into the primary medical visit. And so we are screening people. We're doing PQH9s, which uh, we're screening for depression. Uh, we're doing screenings and brief interventions to treatment. We're doing warm handouts. So you're going to see your primary care doctor. So nobody knows. Mm -hmm. And inside of that exam room, your primary care doctor is doing those initial screenings and handing them over to the case manager who is going to score them and the clinical psychologist is going to review them. Now there's a warm handoff inside the exam room with your trusted primary care physician mm -hmm. over to the behavioral health team and it's seamless and you're still inside the exam room and nobody knows it. So Thank you can, you. you know, we're doing our our prenatal screenings and screening our moms to see who is at risk for postpartum depression. And so when, when you look at wrapping all of those services around the primary care visit, you, you, we find out a lot and people share more with their primary care doctor than they do when they go to a specialist that they may only have one or two interactions with. Okay. Thank you, doctor. There's another question in the chat. Uh, it's also a question that I had because you can have a, a job that provides great medical coverage, but the issue of wellness, which is preventative, sometimes isn't effectively leveraged. Uh, and perhaps maybe particularly in the African-American community, uh, that if they would take the routine or annual physicals, take advantage of those things. Some of these situations could be caught earlier. 
What are some effective strategies that employers could take uh, that would cause the African-American community mm -hmm. specifically or their employee base more broadly to take advantage of healthcare, the wellness aspect of healthcare? Yeah, I think from my perspective, uh, Mike, it's really about meeting people where they are. So a lot of community efforts, um, uh, doing screenings in barber shops, uh, salons, churches, places where African-Americans are comfortable, they typically go, they can congregate, they can influence, influence each other in sort of a non-threatening setting um, is a wonderful way uh, to at least have some sort of screening and access point that feels safe. Mm -hmm. And then you can take the care forward. Thank you, excellent. When I was working on the clinical side, one of the things that we did was we offered annual physicals to our staff. And then we did do health fairs within the community and our staff was welcome to bring their children to the health fairs as well. We tagged on a little something different to it. Um, we, at, we had educational sessions mm -hmm. at our health fair. So it wasn't just going and getting your immunizations or getting your dental check or whatever. We had different sessions on you know, hypertension, diabetes, whatever was plaguing that community at the time. We had education sessions on that and they weren't any longer than 15 minutes. You know, we gave um, you know, follow-up information in case they thought that this was something that you know, they or family member had problems with. And that seemed to go off very well in the community. Community. So that tying that education piece into the actual physical really helped hone in and, and, and actually get some more people um, diagnosed and, and get them at a point where they were able to um, control their disease process before it got out of hand. Mm -hmm. As a former CHRO and Janet, perhaps you, this will resonate with you. I mean, HR departments, we typically manage by emails, posters, other educational means that employees may or may not choose to participate in, but the notion of getting it out into the community where they are, perhaps that could be an effective lever that, that companies can pursue on a going forward basis. Before I turn the baton back over to mm -hmm. Dr. Monica, I would like to, to comment on repar uh, reparation. Uh, I, like some of us, I, I recently read Medical Apartheid, and, and it's, it's appalling, the things that took place, what Dr. Sims did. Yeah, I see it. Yep. Uh, yeah. To me, reparation starts with an acknowledgement of what happened. And I never knew that President Bill Clinton apologized uh, in some oh. fashion for the, you know, what happened at Tuskegee University. But it certainly starts with, a, with an acknowledgement that what was done was an injustice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, we're at a situation, particularly with uh, COVID and the pandemic, that we have to move our community, our race forward and somehow get them beyond that. And, and maybe, if it's, uh, maybe if it starts with an apology, that will move the needle in terms of people deciding that they need to better educate themselves on the pandemic and COVID yeah. and whether they mm -hmm. should take the vaccine. This so is a, Go I'm ahead. so sorry, Mike. No, that was so important. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, I was, I was turning it back over to you. Okay, thank you, Mike. And this was, this was very nice. And you said so many amazing things. And one of them uh, I want to, to say, um, at UN, we have talked about the book, Medical Apartheid. I have used the book um, in my class last semester and the students were amazed. Um, they struggled uh, with the reality of what happened. They, uh, they were disrupted. Really, I had to comfort um, some of them, um, white, African-Americans, it doesn't matter, Latinos, um, uh, Latinx, uh, they were all distraught by the evidence presented in the book. And uh, some of my colleagues, including uh, Dr. Shannon, have, um, they have said the book has a great potential for our students and we need to start somewhere to educate them about these realities. And you also make a, a very good segue, Mike, um, to, uh, for the next question about COVID. So we have learned all these historical facts today from our panelists. 
And we are thinking about this distrust among African Americans. And how can we convince? What do you think is uh, appropriate uh, to uh, discuss the, the benefits of the COVID vaccine uh, with people who do not trust the medical field? I'll start so, by saying, if, if I could, uh, if I'm not on mute, um, I think <laughs> um, one of the big issues that I, I, I see um, that just comes across is how poorly African-American uh, and the like do when it comes to COVID if they get the infection. So we have a higher rate of mortality. We have a higher rate of comorbidities or associated um, problems that occur when we become infected. And me personally have had at least three family members um, who have passed away from this disease. So taking that as the first uh, pinnacle uh, during this discussion tells me that this is a major public health problem. Um, that being said, as a physician, when I look at research, I I read the critical uh, ideas and thoughts and processes of the studies, but ultimately it boils down to risks and benefits. The majority of the risks associated with COVID vaccines uh, are mild to moderate. Um, it's very rare to have an extraordinary or life-threatening uh, side effect when it comes to these vaccines. So that being said, with the just difficult nature of this problem, um, I see it as something that ultimately needs to happen as far as people deciding to take the, the vaccine so that they can protect themselves as well as their community. That's, that's what I would say. For me, I think I would approach it the same way I approach everything else, um, being transparent. Um, again, talking about those risks and benefits, mm -hmm. you know, i I'm a straight shooter. I'm not going to, you know, sugarcoat anything for you. I'm not doing any of that. I'm just going to give you the facts. Yeah, people are dying from this. We're dying more than anybody else. Yeah. Um, and so just taking that and then, you know, just leading by example and making sure, you know, that I have my vaccine as well. So um, mm -hmm. that that's, you know, an important factor. But I think that transparency and, you know, sometimes, you know, being an instructor, you know, we try to tap into our different students' learning styles. So think about that patient that you're dealing with. How do they learn best? Is it that they need to scribble something on a piece of paper? Give them a piece of paper, let them write down those risks and benefits. Whatever it is that will assist them in being able to make an informed decision. Yeah. You know, I um, have seen, uh, well, have heard a number of people who were um, against or did not feel comfortable taking the vaccine. And I think as more people are getting the vaccine and are doing well with it, that role modeling, Dr. Carroll, that you talked about um, really does send a, a pretty powerful message. And I think it does depend on the relationship that you have with the person who may be not wanting to take the vaccine. Certainly it's everyone's choice, but you know, being able to really talk to them about the facts, certainly the risk and benefits, but the facts. And if you did uh, contract the virus, how likely would it be given you know, your age or your situation or your comorbidity that you might not do well, uh, not a fear tactic, but just facts, uh, I find uh, very effective. So, and again, I think um, we've had a number of folks who initially were reluctant and our numbers were not what we wanted them to be. And now we're greater than 66% fully vaccinated. And that's rolling because, you know, as, um, populations are eligible, right, for the vaccine, more and more people are, are getting it. So I do think that those of us who, who feel that it is the responsible thing to do, both for ourselves and for others, if we, you know, tell people, you know, kind of what our experience has been and our why, at least people, I think, can hear it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Since we're talking about the vaccine, um, is there any brand that you think is more effective or one that you prefer? And if you prefer the one, why is that? So I think the people want to know what are experts thinking about these different vaccines that are being proposed today? Uh, 
I can say that the two that have been available initially, the Pfizer and Moderna uh, brands, really look pound for pound to be pretty similar as far as ef efficacy. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're both close to 95% effective in preventing uh, the disease. Um, so I think it would be hard, would be hard to, you know, difficult to say which one is superior. I'm one of those people, however, that I always say the proof's in the pudding. So we'll find out some of the details, the, the low down dirty details as we go forward. But I pray that both will be equally effective in doing what we, um, what we hope they do. Johnson & Johnson, it looks like the numbers are, are a little less as far as the efficacy. However, um, this, this medication was studied in different patient populations. One patient population was in Africa and one was in the United States. And uh, an interesting thing, a caveat from that study is no one died during the study period. So um, it certainly has a positive effect of keeping, keeping people alive and preventing serious disease. Uh, but personally, uh, right now for uh, the medicines that are available, it's difficult for me as a clinician to choose one over the other. And I'm in agreement with that as well. But I am very hopeful that as uh, the J&J one dose vaccine uh, mm -hmm. moves forward uh, to the emergency use for approval, mm -hmm. I think that it might be a lot easier to convince people um, mm -hmm. to get that one shot. <laughs> and also, I believe that uh, it, it will be more convenient for people, particularly mm -hmm. people who have transportation issues, mm -hmm. who are homebound or have difficulty getting around. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that emergency uh, approval will be given soon. And I think that we, we may see more people opting in who mm -hmm. are hesitant to take two vaccines, particularly um, our, our health center will get the Moderna vaccine in about a week. And the only reason why we're getting Moderna is because our, fr our refrigerators will be able to store Moderna. We don't have a minus 72 degrees yeah freezer for the Pfizer vaccine. So we were eligible for Moderna because we have the regular vaccine refrigerators. Um, but I'm very hopeful that as the one dose comes along, that more people will be apt to take that because it's one and done. Mm -hmm. Excellent, oh, very good information. Mike, there is a question um, in the chat. If you, uh, it, it relates to employers and COVID. Would you mind to ask that one? Yeah, I think the, the, the essence of the question is whether employers should make the vaccine mandatory as a condition of employment uh, and, and how does that mesh with, you know, some of the, uh, the biases that we have towards the medical profession and, and the whole notion of informed consent. You know, I can say and open it up obviously to the panelists that as a former chief human resources officer and, and Janet, perhaps you would uh, attest to this as well, the employment law uh, around mandatory vaccines is evolving. Mm -hmm. I've talked to one person who is a vice president and what they're doing, they, they haven't made it mandatory, but they're doing everything they can to encourage people to take the vaccine. Uh, mm -hmm companies that are unionized, then that is something that we'd have that would have to be collectively bargained, just like you would bargain for other wages, benefits and other conditions of employment. Uh, so it's it's evolving. If 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 it does go this way, then I think the obvious solution is how do we overcome uh, some of the concerns that the African community, the African community has, African American community has, based on some of the things that's taken place. Janet, yeah, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, a couple weeks ago. I was um, had a roundtable with other CHROs of different sized health systems, and none of them, none of them at the time, was making the vaccine mandatory. Uh, part of that is because it's still, you know, EAU, it's under, you know, uh, it's not approved fully. So it's the emergency use, which um, is just not prudent to say this is an emergency use drug only and we're going to make you take it. So uh, we haven't done that. It was the only um, company that I heard of 
that had made it mandatory was not a healthcare company. And I don't know what their logic was. It was more like a retail company or something. Um, but generally speaking, healthcare companies are real cognizant of that. And I think we'd want longer term kind of um, results. And I don't know how long, long is uh, as it relates to the speed with which these vaccines were produced um, to, before we would say this is a condition of, of employment. But we definitely are encouraging uh, people to get it. Uh, we're making it very easy for people to get it. Some health systems are charging. Um, we happen to not be charging because we want to remove any barrier. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that there are things that, you know, we can continue to do, model, um, encourage, and just make sure that people have easy access if they want to get it. Yeah. There's a lot of hurdles that would have to be overcome in order for employers to make it mandatory. You know, the whole thing about HIPAA and confidentiality, and you can't even, really, you can't even ask, or you shouldn't be asking, hey, have you, have you taken the vaccine? Mm -hmm. uh, because that, that gets into privacy issues. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not completely analogous, and I'm not trying to draw that, but you really, you can't stop people from smoking. You can stop them from smoking mm -hmm. at work. Right. You can charge them a higher premium, premium right. if they smoke. Right. Uh, but the whole issue of, of what's mandatory and, and what isn't, courts decide. But I think we all would agree if we could better educate our employees about the vaccine, as well as other aspects that improve uh, the health and quality of life, that's, that's the way to go about it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's getting people to want to take it. That drives employee engagement. Making things mandatory decreases right. employee engagement. That's right. That's right. There is some precedence uh, with the flu vaccines. Mm -hmm. You know, many of the healthcare uh, institutions and industries require a flu shot in the fall, yes. and there are very few ex exceptions, uh, religious or uh, allergies. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly, this has been going on for several years now, and it's almost uh, so important that you lose your staff privileges if you don't partake in, you know, in this recommendation. Right. For the flu vaccine um, that is mandatory, I think that there's a longer, you know, track record, longer history, certainly the risk of, you know, making others sick, uh, contributing to an epidemic, you know, all those things are, are true. But to your point, um, if someone has a bona fide reason other than a conscious, you know, a, a conscientious objector, uh, a medical condition or religious, you know, concerns, then there needs to be a process whereby they can declare that and accommodations can be made. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. This is a question for each panelist. What are some of the historical achievements that you believe were the most impactful in promoting African-American health as we know it today? Now mm -hmm. we've talked about certainly uh, some of the adverse uh, actions, uh, but what are some of the, perhaps there are some positive things that you can think of? For me personally was seeing the first African-American urologist in Detroit come my way. <laughs> and that happened sort of serendipitously. Um, as a young person, I needed to see a urologist, had no idea that that was my, my ultimate uh, destiny. I met uh, Dr. Hollowell, who was the first black urologist in the city of Detroit. And when I, ultimately uh, was on track uh, to, uh, to get into, to finish medical school. I was trying to decide what direction to take. And I remembered Dr. Hollowell. So I called him and I said, Dr. Hollowell, do you mind if I come and, and just ask you a few questions about your specialty? He said, no problem. And he sat down with me and he very, so, so kind and gentle. And he told me what he liked and didn't like. And as they say, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. So to me, 
that accomplishment that he made was paramount in me being in this participation today. I saw that, it modeled in my brain and I'm so grateful for it. So it may not be the exact answer to that question, but it's personal answer to that question. Well, thank you, thank you. I think yeah. some of the um, advancements with HIV AIDS has helped out the black community quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of pe patients are now non-detectable based on the, the medications and what have you that are available to them. So I think that's ha that has helped. Mm -hmm. I really like all these questions and um, I think everybody's learning so much from our panelists and Mike uh, as well. Um, I would like to ask a, a, a follow-up question, Days. It's sort of two-part question. So it seems to me that from this conversation, I get that this mistrust that we see among African-Americans in general uh, about the healthcare um, professionals and um, even the COVID vaccine, uh, maybe it could be diminished by having more African-Americans among the health uh, professionals, right? And so my question to you is, how can we make uh, these profession more appealing for African-Americans or um, make sure that more African-Americans actually pursue um, these careers and, and, and they also make it to the top and make it to the leadership. But what can be done to eliminate uh, some of the barriers either at the personal level, subconscious level or over level and the, the physical barriers uh, that exist uh, with the implicit bias that Janet was mentioning before? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take that first. And I think that it starts with mentoring mentoring at a very young age. We could start mentoring these students as early as eighth grade and follow them through. I think when they start seeing more people that look like them that are actually um, in the profession, doing well in the profession, moving up that, that ladder, then they will be more inclined to um, look at um, a health profession. Mm -hmm. um, there's a documentary right now, uh, Black Men in White Coats. I would recommend that uh, students of uh, color be shown uh, those many uh, series. It's a it's brief, uh, very segmented, um, starting in January, to uh, talk to those uh, students who and residents, medical students and residents. Um, these many documentaries kind of highlight and spotlight the challenges and the successes they've had as they're starting um, their residency programs and from uh, getting into medical school and those challenges, but encouraging and increasing the number of African-American males in particular, but African-American in general um, in the healthcare profession. So I would recommend that uh, documentary series. That's Thank a great you. reference. <laughs> yeah, I actually did not see the documentary, but there is a book by the same name, mm -hmm. but they're separate. They're not, you know, they're not connected. So uh, yeah, black men in white coats, absolutely. Uh, I totally agree with you, Dr. Seabrook. I also think that, um, you know, ensuring that potential can be spotted. Uh, Dr. Carroll talked about mentoring, but just, you know, encouraging people to put forth their best and celebrating um, African-Americans in all fields. So I don't mean this as a as a diss, mm -hmm. um, but we're more than athletes and we're more than entertainers. Um, and just really celebrating what African-Americans can do, what people can do, and we just happen to be African-Americans. See, I love that. It's really about mm -hmm. the potential. We just happen to be African-American, which if that is something, a dimension that's desired, just puts a cherry on the top, right? Mm -hmm. That just puts the cherry, that diversifies thinking about uh, an entire group of people who historically have been underestimated. And so I just love it, you know, still we mm -hmm. rise. Right. Yeah. I, I think one other thing, too, is making undergraduate and uh, uh, graduate level school more affordable uh, for mm -hmm. uh, people in general, because the costs are just yeah. out of order. I know I'm on a, <laughs> I'm on IUN's uh, <laughs> Zoom, but uh, the cost of, of college <laughs> on a serious note, the cost of college has really um, made uh, some uh, college unattainable for some students and not to think about graduate school and graduate school programs. The costs are, have really skyrocketed. You know, that's something, this doesn't apply so much to um, physicians or medical education, but 
looking at what we require as employers, what we, we require, do, does a job really need a four-year degree? Now, a physician, absolutely. But does a professional job? I mean, if they've worked some and they have a two-year degree, I mean, is that, so I think just re-examining conventional thinking that we've just accepted for so long, what about that role, you know, means that you have to have a college degree. The IT area, for example, um, many, many senior leaders who are older have grown up and they have high school diplomas. It's because they've been in the, uh, you know, in the uh, career path for so long and they've had so many experiences that they have, you know, amassed themselves things that help them be successful. So I do think that we have to maybe challenge conventional wisdom that says, oh, you got to have a four year degree for this. Well, do you really? Maybe not. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, this is an excellent conversation and I wish we could continue more. I would have another 20 questions, but I'm going to pass the baton to Crystal. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for the great discussion. Thank you so much, everyone, um, from our moderator to our panelists to all of the great questions that were posted. Um, as a way to wrap us up for the evening, I we thought it would be wonderful to ask our truly founding um, benefactor and supporter for this organization, um, Dr. Charles Hobson, to give us some closing remarks. And I did catch him off guard with this guy, so please be gentle. Dr. Hobson. <laughs> Yes, you did, Crystal, and I'll get you back for that. You know that. <laughs> uh, this uh, session was, from my perspective, uh, very impressive. As someone said, I wish we could have broadcast this to the entire university community. Uh, it was very educational, very inspirational. And, and I was very impressed with our speakers, uh, very impressed, as always, with Mike, with, with uh, uh, Monica's great work and Crystal as uh, one of the founding presidents, co-presidents of the organization and Andrea uh, as our faculty advisor. So this is the beginning of a process that we hope to continue to address some of the specific issues that our panelists recommended. We want to facilitate the success of our African-American students. We want to facilitate their academic success, their occupational success, and their personal growth and development. So this was a fantastic uh, first step in that direction. So I really appreciate everyone spending your time, devoting your time to uh, help us in this. Uh, thank, thank you, all of you. And thanks, Crystal, for putting me on the spot. As I said, I will get you back. Thank <laughs> you. That I have no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again everyone and please stay safe out there stay diligent and have a great evening you as well thank Bye. you thank you good night everyone thank you. good night to everybody thank you again good, good night, night everybody thank good you night. so much thank you. thanks everyone mm -hmm.